So now we are live. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just to check. Uh, So now we are live. Uh, I would like to ask one question to the audience just to, just to check if uh, you can see and hear us well. So do you hear me well? Yes, this is uh, a question to the audience. Uh, I would like to check with you whether you can hear and see as well. So do you hear me well? That before we start, so now, now we are live with Dr. Nizar Ibrahim. Mm. Yeah, I need your feedback, please. So for the Moroccan audience, uh, those who don't speak uh, English, uh, by the way, our guest also speak, uh, speaks uh, Darija, right, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yes, loud and clear. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, or good evening, uh, wherever you might be in this world. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. It is my privilege now to extend to you a warm welcome on behalf of Moulay Ismail University in Meknes, Morocco. I'm very, very happy and honored to welcome and introduce our distinguished special guest, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim, who is going to talk about an interesting and amazing topic, paleontology and anatomy. Before the webinar, the webinar begins, allow me uh, to give a brief definition to him for those who do not know him. Actually, he's known worldwide, internationally, but just uh, I have to give a brief introduction. So Dr. Nizar Ibrahim is a Moroccan-German vertebrate paleontologist and a comparative anatomist with a, a background in bio and geosciences, a PhD in vertebrate paleontology from Ireland's leading medical school, an extensive research and teaching experience. He is based at the University of Detroit Mercy in USA, where he is an assistant professor of biology and teaches courses in anatomy and evolution. So he is one of the youngest explorers ever to lead expeditions to the Sahara. He has unearthed spectacular dinosaur bones, rare fossil footprints, giant prehistoric fish, crocodile-like hunters, and the new species of giant flying reptile with a 20-foot wingspan that lived 95 million years ago. His current research interests include vertebrate paleontology and morphology and evolution, Mesozoic, chronostratigraphy, and bioinformatics. For many years, Dr. Ibrahim has been obsessed with one of the great mysteries in paleontology, the giant predatory dinosaur, Spinosaurus. Ibrahim's remarkable story and the findings of an international team of scientists were published in the journal Science and as a cover story of, uh, for National Geographic magazine. What has been unveiled appears to be the first truly semi-aquatic dinosaur, Spinosaurus, Spinosaurus aegypticus. So he is passionate about the public understanding of science. Over the last decade, he has reached millions of people around the globe using a multitude of formats, including high-profile speaking, tours, exhibits, educational videos, and books. In 2014, Dr. Ibrahim was named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. And in 2015, he was named a TED Fellow, the first paleontologic in history of TED. So thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahim, for being with us and for accepting the invitation to be here with us for this enlightening webinar. Shukran, thanks, thanks so much for having me and, and thanks for the introduction. My pleasure. Uh, 
Uh, so just for the, the audience, you can uh, uh, post your uh, questions, but uh, later on we'll open the door for questions, of course, that, are not, that have not been covered. Uh, so, uh, Professor, uh, I know that you speak uh, Arabic, of course, uh, Darija. You know, of course, uh, some <laughs> words, so you still know some Darija, right? Yes, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you speak Arabic, uh, uh, French, German, English, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, but, but I think, uh, Prof. Uh, Doctor, that we, uh, this topic should be discussed in English, maybe for uh, academic and scientific reasons. Yes. Um, right now, the world we live in is a world where uh, English is the language of science as well as the language of business and many other things. And, um, you know, in the past, there was a time when, you know, German was the language of science. Um, but today, English is the language of science. And so um, it is very important to, um, you know, be fluent enough in English to understand the science as it is published and, and um, shared with the world. Um, and uh, it's also easier when you're talking about technical subjects, right? It's a bit like when you talk about technology, right? Almost all of the terms are English terms, right? If you're talking about the internet or, you know, whatever, um, uh, English is a very important um, door opener, so to speak. So uh, that's why before we talk about our uh, today's uh, topic, paleontology, uh, anatomy and evolution, I would like you to talk about the importance of science nowadays and the importance of English, especially for students, for researchers who would like to continue their studies in uh, abroad and who want to, uh, let's say, excel in science. So the importance of English. Well, um, it is very, very important. I work with scientists from all around the world and the language we all use when we're communicating is, is English, right? Um, uh, our publications are in English. Almost all of the major scientific journals are published in English. And so even if you're a scientist in you know, Japan, um, you will still have to write a lot of your scientific writing in English to share it with people all around the world. And so I think countries like Morocco are in a strange place because of a, a colonial legacy, right? I think um, if you want to be rational about it, there are not many good reasons to say, for example, in Morocco that we're going to put French as our top priority, right, for, for, for languages. In the European Union, and I'm quoting the numbers from the European Union, in the European Union, the most widely spoken language is German, then English, um, then Italian, and then French. Um, so there is no rational reason to say we have to do that. It's basically a consequence of colonialism. In some way, it's a form of neo-colonialism, right? It's this very strong binding between um, the former, you know, protectorat and, you know, France. Um, but it is a problem um, when you go to scientific conferences, international conferences, and you see Moroccan scientists, many of them are struggling to communicate and to, you know, to do their presentations. And, you know, so I think you're losing the connection with the cutting edge of science if, um, you know, your language skills do not allow you to, to really take part in this process. And so many Moroccan scientists collaborate, of course, with scientists in France, and they try to publish in small journals where they can publish in French, but even those journals are dying out. They're going extinct, so to speak. Um, and so it is very important to, um, to be open um, and realistic um, to those things, but it is difficult. There's obviously a lot of historical baggage there, um, but hopefully this is going to change. Yeah, uh, even paleontologists uh, publish articles uh, in English. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, the vast majority of articles are published in English. There are some uh, German and French and Italian journals left, but even in those journals, you just publish a short resume, a short um, summary um, in French, German, English, but uh, in French, German, or Italian, but the main article is entirely in English. So even those little niche journals have evolved and moved to this new format. And so 
in that sense, you know, um, even those last little refuges <laughs> have have disappeared. And so there's it's just a reality, you know. And I think it's it's also in other areas. I think economic areas as well. Um, I don't want to go be too controversial, but let's say that you know Morocco probably doesn't need a TGV. You know, it's not the top priority. Mm -hmm. But there's all kinds of strange things happening, and it's not often for the benefit of Morocco. You know, if you want to do a car race, why not try a BMW or a Mercedes? Why insist on going with a Citroën? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know there are other options out there, and so I think it's important to. Um, open up to the world and really move to a post-colonial stage, so to speak. Yeah, interesting. So uh, actually, English is a key to open the door to the outside world. world. Yes. In, in, in today's yeah, in today's world, if you are not fluent in English, you may not be able to realize your true potential and land the job that you aspire for. Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely Especially true. We need yeah, especially, especially when it comes to jobs, getting a job, getting a steady job, maybe. Yeah, definitely. That's that's the way yeah. things are. And I think, you know, it's um, it's a relatively easy language to learn. That's one reason why it's so widespread. Um, and, you know, in science, we are no longer in a time where you can just sit down and try to translate everything. You know, you need to be able to be up to date um, without too much effort. And so, yeah, just just some, you know, and it's a very easy change to make, you know. Um, in, um, I think, three or four years ago, I was in uh, Rwanda, in Africa. Rwanda used to be French-speaking. Franco, c'était la francophonie. La and then they changed everything, um, partly after the genocide, where France was in some way, you know, did not play a good role. And so they changed everything. And switched the education schools to English. And it made a huge difference. It opened up the door for philanthropism from the United States and collaborations with English speaking scientists and business partners and, and so on and so on. So it's, um, it's not a difficult decision to make, but of course, as I said, the, the, the situation is very complicated in Morocco. I think Morocco has a very strange relationship with, with France, I think. And it's very difficult to move to a new level, a new relationship, unfortunately. Unfortunately. So, so what would your advice be to a student, researcher who wants to excel in science? Well, I think um, it depends what area of science you're interested in. But of course, um, language skills are important now. So I think having a solid foundation in English is very important. So you can keep up with the, the most recent publications and so on. Um, and then just being open, you know, because again, we have this tunnel vision where you sometimes have people saying like, oh, you know, I can go to some, you know, I don't know, Grande Ecole or some, you know, <laughs> some something very narrow. Um, and that's not very helpful. So I think it's good to be open to opportunities all around the world um, because science is so international today and many of the best opportunities are in places that are not necessarily the, the the classic path for scientists in Morocco, for example, you know, or students. So I think it's very important to keep your mind wide open um, because otherwise you're just limiting yourself and you're putting yourself in a position where you're not going to be employable or where you'll be competing with many, many people for these like two or three jobs in, in France or in, in Morocco. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, actually, English uh, is a must nowadays. So for uh, people who want to continue their studies, especially for students, Moroccan students. Uh, so uh, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim, uh, let's talk. Let's move on to talk about today's topic, paleontology and anatomy. Before we uh, uh, define uh, paleontology, anatomy, and uh, uh, the work or, or uh, of this uh, uh, discipline or field, uh, I would like you, you to ask you first uh, how uh, you became interested in this field of work in theology, well, paleontology and anatomy at the same time. It started when I was about four or five years old and it started with a book. Um, yeah. I got a children's book and it was um, a book that... Um, 
describe the world of dinosaurs and other extinct animals. And for me, it was like I was discovering an entire new world, you know? I just saw these incredible creatures, these animals from, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. And they were more spectacular than the dragons from our, you know, uh, um, uh, fairy tales and, and, and stories and legends. Um, and I realized that this was one way to combine many of my passions. Um, animals, I was always interested in animals and understanding how they work and how they changed. And um, I also always loved the idea of traveling to far flung places in the world. I would always look at maps of the world and look at places and say like, oh, one day I want to go to Mongolia. And one day I want to go to Australia and Timbuktu and <laughs> all these exotic places. And so I realized paleontology allows me to combine all of those things. And um, I, I will show you uh, um, just very briefly. I'll see if I can share my screen. Um, okay. So let me see. Can you see my um, slide now? Does that work? Mm. Let me see. Oh, actually, let me see. Um, there we go. Can you see it now? Uh, mm, not yet. Should be showing now. It says it's screen yes, sharing. Uh, uh, maybe I have to add it to the stream, yeah. Uh, If not, it doesn't matter, but it's, say, it's saying it's, it's yeah, uh, Maybe having trouble connecting. Uh, maybe we can ask um, if the audience can see yeah. the screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see now, yeah. Oh, you can? Okay. See, yeah, lots of pictures. Yeah, this is a picture with a crocodile, right? That's right, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... So this is, this is what my um, job looks like <laughs> today. One of the reasons I, uh, I love this, this work I'm doing is I get to do all of these incredible things, um, like on this picture here, look at incredible living animals like this alligator. Um, wow. To understand. That's real. It's a live alligator. It's a, a living wow. alligator, but <laughs> it's, it's well-behaved. <laughs> <laughs> I study um, living animals. So I'm not, many people think paleontology is just about old bones and skeletons. You also spend a lot of time studying the anatomy of living creatures to understand how animals work. If we want to understand how a dinosaur moved, for example, or a Spinosaurus swam through the water, um, we have to look at living animals and their muscles and, and bones and skin. Um, so this is a part of what I do. Um, I also do um, some uh, work on uh, in, in human anatomy. I don't know, can you see a picture of a human skeleton yeah. now? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I um, teach anatomy, um, including also um, uh, human anatomy courses. And um, so I train the next generation of you know doctors and dentists and nurses. Um, by showing them the anatomy of the human body. So I do uh, dissections of human bodies, real human bodies, to show them um, how our body is put together. Um, and I also got to excavate some human uh, skeletons, which is what you can see on this picture here. This is a human yeah. skeleton I excavated in Niger um, in Africa. Uh, so this is a few thousand years old. It's a, a human skeleton. Um, I also work in the field of bioinformatics, um, and you don't have to worry about the details on this picture here, but what we're trying yeah. to do is we're trying to make anatomy computer readable. Um, so, so it's a very diverse um, career for me. Um, but of course, my, my real passion is um, the yeah. world of dinosaurs. These are the most spectacular animals out there. Um, and so this is, this is the world I... Um, I, I try to resurrect. Yeah. Uh, and stop sharing for now, I think. Yeah, there yeah, we go. It's fine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank, you, thank you very much for sharing with us your experience. Your story is fascinating and actually amazing, miraculous experience. Uh, I, I think you were...
Yeah, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Uh, now I can hear you again. Can you just repeat? I think I lost you for a second. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Dr. Nizar? Yes, I can hear you. You were just gone for a few seconds. It's probably the internet connection. But I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I Okay, thank you for, for sharing with us your experience. Your uh, your story is amazing and fascinating, actually. So miraculous experience. I, I think you, you you were born with these skills. Uh, dinosaur killed and hunter. So people learned how to be to become a paleontologist. But I think you were born with these skills. Well, it's it's a lot of work because you have to understand not just anatomy the way bodies are put together, but you also have to understand um, some geology because of course the fossils of dinosaurs are found in the rocks. So you also need to understand the science of rocks, geology. And then geology, yeah. we sometimes use um, bio-robotics. Archaeology? Um, well, archaeology is more recent human things, right? Um, but it's, so it's mostly zoology, anatomy, and geology. But we also use modern technology now, like CT scanning, fossils. And so it's it's not easy, but it's very, very rewarding. And it's a lot of fun. It's never boring. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Nizar, you traveled, uh, as you said, to far flank corners of the world, uh, including the Kamkam region between Morocco and Algeria, uh, to uh, uncover new remains. I mean, uh, incredible specimens, uh, creatures, etc. Could you please describe the condition you worked uh, in the Kamkam region? And uh, uh, we know that this place is a special place on Earth. And what makes it uh, special? What's make it uh, make it a special place? Yeah. Well, it's a special place for a number of reasons. Um, and I, I'll just share my screen again, just to. Um, tell you about a couple of reasons why it's such a special place. Um, and let me know when you see the, uh, the slides. Yeah. yeah. You can see them? Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. so one reason it's a special place is a very simple reason. It's in Africa. We know very little about the dinosaurs of, of, of Africa um, or the age of dinosaurs from, from Africa. Um, the picture you see here is a museum it's the Natural History Museum in Berlin, in Germany, where I grew up. And it's a special museum because they have a big collection of African dinosaurs. It's very unusual. And so when I was growing up, I saw these skeletons of dinosaurs from Tanzania, actually, Tanzania in Africa. And so I knew there are special places in Africa where you can find dinosaur fossils. Most of the dinosaur fossils um, we have um, have been found in North America or Europe. Uh, but very few come from Africa. So I always wanted to go to, to Africa and find these uh, incredible um, African dinosaurs. These are This is the dinosaur hall in Berlin um, filled with African dinosaur skeletons from Tanzania. Um, uh, this is another picture. This one is from Niger, um, uh, again, in Africa, um, on the southern edge of the Sahara. This is a footprint of a dinosaur in Niger. So I always had this idea of going to Africa um, but one of the main reasons for me was that this paleontologist here, um, a German paleontologist called Ernst Stromer, found some incredible fossils in the Sahara Desert, including fossils of this animal here, which he named Spinosaurus. And he didn't have many bones. The dark bones you can see here are the ones he, he described in his scientific publications. Um, and he found you know, several skeletons of African dinosaurs. And they were really strange and really interesting. But unfortunately, they were all destroyed in World War II. In World War II, all of his skeletons were destroyed because the, the museum in Germany where he worked was completely um, destroyed in the war. And so I always wanted to rediscover these lost dinosaurs of the Sahara. Um, and when we started working in the Kemkem region in Morocco, we found... Um, a treasure trove of fossils. We found these incredible 
fossils, thousands of fossils, including yeah. bones of giant predatory dinosaurs like this one here, Tacharodontosaurus. Um, we found bones of giant plant-eating dinosaurs, um, like this long-necked plant-eating dinosaur here. Um, so we found really incredible things. And one of the most exciting things is that um, many of the fossils we find are fossils of water-loving creatures, like this giant fish. Um, this fish here, a coelacanth, is about as big as a car. And we're talking big car. Zama, she, she had a cat cat, a really big cat car. Cat. <laughs> and, um, and that tells us that this was um, a river system, basically. Um, a, a giant river system, right? And that's how I explain it to some of the people in the Kem Kem region when I show him the bones. I tell them that this, you know, I had a blessing and can feel how I had wed Kabir, like a really, really big river. And yeah, it was yeah. full of these incredible creatures. Now it looks very different. It's a very dry and, and inhospitable place. And the conditions are really difficult. There are sandstorms and snakes and scorpions. Um, and sometimes you work in military areas. Um, wow. And it's very, very hot. Um, so. You know, some of the people um, on my team were severely dehydrated, even though we took all the precautions. You know, it's just very hard work. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as I said, sometimes you need a military escort when you're walking near the Algerian border. So it's, it's, it's quite challenging. But we found incredible things, including um, many, many bones of this mysterious dinosaur, Spinosaurus, which, which um, you just mentioned, including the tail of Spinosaurus, which you can see here. We have about 80% of the tail, and it's a really, really unique tail. No other dinosaur has a tail like this. Um, it's a tail that looks like a giant paddle to move the animal through the water. So this was a dinosaur, we now know, with a crocodile-like skull um, and a strange paddle tail to swim through the water. So it was a very unusual animal. It's the only dinosaur we know of um, that really spent most of its time in the water. So this was a river monster in these giant river systems that existed in the Sahara. This was uh, the biggest predator. It was about 15 meters long and hunted these giant fish in this incredible river system. So that really gives you uh, a sense of, you know, geological time. When people think of the Sahara, they think of this sand, uh, uh, the sea of sand and, and sand dunes. But 100 million years ago, that's when Spinosaurus lived. Um, this is what this place looked like. It was a giant river system. And Spinosaurus was the um, ruler of this ancient river system. A really, really unusual dinosaur. And it was a giant predator. You can see Spinosaurus yeah. compared to other giant predatory dinosaurs from other parts of the world. Um, Spinosaurus was the longest predatory dinosaur and also the strangest. It had this really big sail on its back and the crocodile-like jaws and the strange tail. Um, so it was such a special animal that, you know, we, we built a big exhibit um, um, with a, um, a skeleton of Spinosaurus. Um, it was featured on the cover of National Geographic. It was featured on the cover of the world's top scientific journal, um, Nature, last year. Um, so it was a really exciting discovery. But I should add that really we found an entire... Um, lost world, it was not just Spinosaurus, it was many, many other creatures that lived alongside Spinosaurus. And so being a paleontologist for me is a little bit like being a time traveler, you know? You, you, it's like you have a special capsule that brings you back 100 million years ago to a very different kind of world. Yeah, interesting, um, amazing giant creatures. So um, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, did you find uh, any complete dinosaur skeleton in the Kemkem region? Yes, um, there are not many dinosaur skeletons there. Um, you usually just find isolated bones. You'll find many teeth, isolated teeth, many isolated bones, but very, very few skeletons. Um, so it's really hard work. It's like detective work. It's And you need a lot of patience. And patience uh, is different. Maybe I have here a, a picture of a, a bone you are excavating. Uh, I'm going to sh 
Yes. This one? Yeah. Yes. This so is in this, Kim Kim? Yes. This was, um, we found this one um, over 10 years ago. This is the largest bone ever found in, in the Kim Kim region, ever. Um, it's the humerus, so the upper arm bone of a very large plant-eating dinosaur. This plant-eating dinosaur would have been so big, it would have weighed about... 60 tons, soixante wow. tons. So that's like wow. the weight of an entire herd of elephants <laughs> into perspective. And that's another reason why these creatures are amazing. They push the boundaries of anatomy. How can you be so big and still survive? You know, how can you be um, such a giant creature and, um, you know, be so successful? Um, that's, that's one of the many mysteries. But this bone was really difficult. We found it on a mountain. So we had to do, bring it down the mountain. <laughs> Four people had to lift the bone. We built like a, a wooden stretcher to, to lift it and then bring it wow. down the mountain and bring it into our car. And then the car was so heavy, it kept sinking yeah. into the sand dunes. <laughs> it was crazy. But this was a very special uh, moment when we found this because I was still a PhD student at the time in 2008. And we found oh. this this bone and many many other things. So that was great. Interesting. So uh, how how did you know where to look for Spinosaurus or Dinosaurus in general? How, how do you know that? How how do you look for when you are walking? So how do you know that this place could contain could have uh, bones, uh, creatures uh, of Spinosaurus, or just you go uh, like that and try to discover? Yeah. Well. Um... Let's put it this way, there's two different stages. The first stage, pour, pour commencer, on a des, des cartes géologiques. We have geological maps. And these maps Cara tell it. us where the rocks of the right age are found, right? So you can look at a map and you can see maybe in green rocks from the Cretaceous period, right? And you know, okay, this is where you could, could find dinosaurs. But it's still a very big area. So you go there and then you have to start looking and sometimes we can use some modern technology. Might, we might look at Google Earth satellite images to see if we can find interesting places. Um, or we look at, um, uh, you know, sometimes some people have used drones or similar things. Um, but then you really spend a lot of time just walking around looking for bones sticking out of the ground. So it's a lot of walking, a lot of, um, again, a lot of patience. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, it's fine. So, so there's still a lot of walking around involved once you're there. Um, and you're looking for bones that are sticking out of the ground so that most of the skeleton is still protected underground. But it's, it's difficult. So our, our methods to find dinosaur skeletons have not really changed much. Um, our scientific studies and analysis of the fossils have changed a lot. But finding the fossils is still very difficult, just like, you know, 100 years ago when, when Stroma was founding the first Spinosaurus bones or describing them. Yeah, uh, interesting. So, uh, Dr. Lizar, uh, we know that you found some uh, creatures, skeletons, uh, uh, giants, uh, predatory uh, dinosaurs. So, uh, 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 all dinosaurs went extinct or not? Well, um, dinosaurs were a very, were very, very successful because um, little mammals existed during the time of the dinosaurs. And these little mammals um, were our ancestors. You know, we, were, we are mammals. So these little mammals existed, but the dinosaurs were dominant. So we sometimes think that mammals are superior and so on, but that's not what happened. Dinosaurs were very, very successful for a very long time. Um, and then we know that they um, suffered a major extinction event when a meteorite hit our planet. Um, and, we th and many people think all the dinosaurs went extinct. But we know 
that many dinosaurs actually had feathers. Um, we have found the fossilized feathers on dinosaurs and they have skeletons that are almost identical to those of birds. And we now have many, many skeletons, especially from China, many fossils that show us that birds evolved from small predatory dinosaurs. And so scientifically speaking, birds are dinosaurs. And so this is one branch of the dinosaur tree that has survived. So these dinosaurs, birds, are still around us. So not all of them have gone extinct. And birds are very successful, as you know. They live in the water like penguins. They live in hot deserts. They live in rainforests. And there are more species of birds than mammals. So the, the age of dinosaurs hasn't really ended. Uh, so we can say that birds are the closest living relative to dinosaurs. Well, we can say birds are dinosaurs. They are, are. Um, they are in the dinosaur family tree. So not only are they closest relatives, scientifically speaking, birds are dinosaurs. Um, but they are not big. They are not giants as dinosaurs. No, no this is just one branch of the dinosaur tree. Um, so all the big dinosaurs um, that, you know, with the long necks and so on, those are all extinct. But one branch of predatory dinosaurs evolved into birds and birds are still around. So this is one branch. Um, there are still some big birds like uh, ostriches, for example, right? But they're not like a T-Rex or Spinosaurus. <laughs> uh, uh, so but, uh, can, you, uh, can you say uh, why dinosaurs uh, were so big? That's a good question. I think um, mammals have some anatomical limitations that dinosaurs didn't have. Dinosaurs had a very different physiology. They had more efficient breathing, for example, than you and I. They had better breathing than mammals. They had breathing like, like birds today. Birds have a very efficient system of breathing with air sacs. Um, they had a different digestion, uh, digestive system. Many of the really big dinosaurs had a, a fermentation chamber to, to process food. Um, and they had, um, you know, uh, an, uh, adaptations inside their bones that also allowed them to grow very big. Many of them had bones that were 90% air, so they look very big, but they were kind of marvels of biological engineering, if you like. Um, so it's very difficult to compare mammals and dinosaurs. And it's, I think the question is not really, why did dinosaurs get so big? The question is more, why did mammals not get so big, right? So why are elephants the biggest animals today? And that's because mammals have some, uh, a number of physiological and anatomical um, restrictions or limitations that dinosaurs did not have. Um, but uh, di not all dinosaurs were big. Many dinosaurs were small. Um, some were just as big as a chicken, so a really good pet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and... Um, and they came in all shapes and sizes. I think we're just beginning to understand how diverse they really were. Um, but of course, many people are really fascinated with the very big ones. So we yeah. have a biased view because we like to, you know, talk about the biggest yeah. animal, the biggest the big. fish, the biggest bird, the biggest dinosaur. Yeah, flying reptile. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, but but what, do you, what do you think about uh, blue whales? So they are so big, don't you think that they, uh, they, they share uh, or they have common ancestors with dinosaurs? So they are so big. Well, whales are, uh, of course, mammals. Um, they give uh, birth to live young and they give milk, um, which, of course, dinosaurs don't do. Dinosaurs lay eggs and um, eggs. they uh, are reptiles. Um, whales are special because in the water it's much easier to grow very big yeah. because the water supports your weight a whale doesn't have to worry about weight like an elephant right elephants have to worry about how they move um, whales can grow so big because they don't need legs the water supports them right so they just have these massive tail flukes um, but it is true whales are the only animals that are bigger than almost all of the big dinosaurs. Um, the difference is just, as I said, they're marine animals and the rules are very different for marine animals. Um, in the ocean, 
um, there used to be a shark, Megalodon, that was um, 18 meters long, a giant shark that was eating wow. whales. There used to be mosasaurs, uh, which you also find in Morocco, by the way, les mosasaurs, which are giant marine reptiles. They were also 15, 16 meters long. Um, wow. So in the ocean, many groups of animals get big because the water makes it much easier. And, um, you know, the food webs are also different in the ocean. So the rules are slightly different. So when, we, when we're talking about dinosaurs, usually we compare them with land animals. And that's why I was saying, you know, why do elephants not get bigger than, than they are, for example? Interesting. So m maybe we will talk about that when 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 we uh, move on to talk about evolution and how yeah. they uh, yeah how how uh, animals or creatures evolve. Uh, so what's interesting in, uh, or new information you get from uh, skeletons? We as a pantheon object. Yeah. Yeah, well, you can get a lot of information from bones. I mean, sometimes we find fossils of other things like feathers, for example, or skin. Um, but usually we find bones, but bones tell us a lot. Bones um, have attachment points for muscles. So we can see just from a bone, we can see how big the muscles were. We can um, understand some of the adaptations of an animal. Some animals, uh, flying animals have very light bone, for example. So you can look at these adaptations. You can look at bones um, of dinosaurs and look at their growth. How did they grow? So you cut a dinosaur leg bone, for example, and you can see little lines, a bit like the lines in a tree, right? So you can see how old this dinosaur was. You can try to look at the growth of one species of dinosaurs from small skeletons to big skeletons. You know, um, how many years did they grow before they would die typically? Or, you know, so you can s find out so many things from bones and teeth. It's really remarkable. And that's also true for human teeth. You know, I showed you a human skeleton I found. You can find out so many things. You can tell from a skeleton if it was a man or a woman. You can look at the teeth and they will tell you a lot about the diet. You know, some, you might find little abrasion from sand in their diet, you know, and you can find out that they were living in a sandy area or you can find tumors. We have found a, a bone cancer tumor on a dinosaur, right? It was described a couple of years ago. So cancer was very ancient. Even dinosaurs had cancer. Um, and so, you know, bones are pretty amazing and very durable, right? After millions of years, we can still find them. So there's a lot you can learn from bones for sure. Yeah. And of course, uh, they tell you a lot about evolution. Yes, of course. Um, one of the things we, we see is... Um, when you, what we're doing as paleontologists is we, we're writing the pages of a very, very big story, the story of life on earth, the story of evolution. And so when you go back in time, you see the entire story of evolution. You can see a time, an age of fishes, when all the creatures you could see on earth were fishes. And then you can see fossils of the first animals that came out of water you find fossils of the first amphibians and then the first reptiles mm -hmm. and mammals. Um, and so you can really see these big chapters, but you can also see some incredible transitions. So for example, um, you mentioned whales, right? So we know whales, whales don't have big legs, right? But we have found fossils of extinct whales, including in Egypt, by the way, and Morocco, where you can find fossils of ancient whales. And um, there are also some great places in Pakistan and other um, uh, countries where these fossils have been found. And you can put them chronologically and you can see that the ancestors of whales had long legs, long legs. And then over time, when you go chronologically younger and younger in the rocks, you can see the legs get shorter and shorter because these, the animals spend more and more time in the water until the legs disappear. But even in a modern whale, if you cut it open, you will find some tiny little bones from the hip, right? So you can still see the traces of legs. Yeah. legs. And the same is true for snakes. We have fossils of snakes with legs. So snakes used to have legs. Um, I mentioned that birds are dinosaurs. You know, in French, we, are, we say there's a saying, quand les poules auront des dents, right? 
Um, now we know les poules avaient déjà des dents. <laughs> Dinosaurs had yeah. long yeah. teeth. Yeah. And teeth, so tooth yeah. loss is a more recent thing. And so paleontology allows us to reconstruct these incredible transitions, including the ones leading to humans. Um, as you know, Africa is a very famous place for fossils of human ancestors, right? And so we, uh, we know from genetics, for example, because evolution is not just about paleontology, we know from genetics that the common ancestor, if you think of it as like a branch, the common ancestor of um, humans and chimpanzees lived about 7 million years ago, right? And so we look for fossils that came after this branching point, right? And we find fossils of, that are transitional, you know, um, um, hominids, so uh, members of our family tree with long arms for life in, in trees. And then we, find, we see all kinds of anatomical changes um, all the way to modern humans. So it's a really incredible story because it also allows us to understand where we came from. It's, you know, the story of life is, is a story of connectedness. All living things are connected. We are all written in DNA, right? Um, and so humans are not separate from life, right? Um, that's the reason why we can also get viruses from, from other animals, for example, like bats now, with, yeah. you know. Um, we are part of this incredible tree. And so we can reconstruct the evolution of so many different animals from dogs and cats and turtles and giraffes and humans. And we need many different disciplines, paleontology, genetics, also developmental biology. If you look at the embryos of a human and a cat and a, a crocodile or a turtle, you can also study some of these key anatomical changes. So it's, it's a really you know, profound um, experience for, for scientists, you know, to, to piece this together because it's an incredible story. And, um, you know, unfortunately in, in some parts of the world, evolution is under attack, right? Yeah. It's, it's, which is a, which is for a scientist, it's very strange because it's a bit like if you're a physicist and you hear that, the theory of gravity is under attack. And you go like, what, why, yeah. you know, it's gravity. Everyone can, can see it, but it's like many other things with, with science. I think scientists have to do more to communicate their science. That's why museums yeah. are important and books yeah. and, you know. Yeah. I mean yeah, maybe we can talk about that, the, the importance of having museums in, in different uh, places, uh, in different countries. Uh, what I think, which is fascinating, I, uh, I, I find in, uh, in uh, dinosaurs, is that they have small uh, arms. Well, some of them did. Some, some of, of them, them did. Yes. Um, but, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. So some dinosaurs had very big arms, actually, with big claws, really, really big, long arms. Um, some were walking on four legs, others were walking on two legs. But you are probably thinking of an animal like, um, Tyrannosaurus rex, right? Tyrannosaurus rex. T rex, yeah. T rex, very short forelimbs with just two fingers, right? And when we look at it, we always have an um, anthropocentric view. Like we always think humans is the gold standard, right? So we compare everything to humans. And so we yeah. say, this dinosaur has short arms. But of course, the T rex could tell us humans have really short tails <laughs> because we just yeah. have a few tailbones left. The reason is we don't use our tails anymore. So our tailbone has become very short. You sometimes still feel it. If you fall and you land on your bottom, <laughs> you feel these tailbones, right? But it's yeah. very few. We call it the coccyx. It's just a few fused tailbones. And so for the T-Rex, it's the same thing. It didn't use, it didn't need these forelimbs anymore, the arms, because it had, uh, it was doing all its hunting with these big jaws. It had a very strong bite. And so it wasn't using the forelimbs. And if something is not being used anymore, it starts to become smaller and smaller, like the legs in the whales, right? That's why the whale legs got shorter and shorter. And so, you know, the T-Rex had perfect proportions for its lifestyle in the same way that humans have, you know, the proportions that we need for walking on two legs and doing things with our hands. So 
I think it's we just have a very human centric view of everything. So you always say, why does a giraffe have such a long neck, or why does it yeah. have a T Rex such short arms? But as a biologist, you of course you know these animals are all well adapted to their lifestyle. Maybe they resemble a kangaroo. <laughs> yeah, in some ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I have here. Uh, uh, I, I will show you. Uh, maybe this. Yeah, here is a list. I think of animals, theropod dinosaurs. I think all of them have small arms, right? Yes. This is because this is one group of dinosaurs, the theropod yeah. dinosaurs. Um, and some of them had relatively long arms. If you look at the top, there's one with feathers, and it's called Deinonychus. Um, next to the Cacarodontosaurus, you can see it at the top. Yeah, it has, yeah this one. Yeah. It has quite long arms. Um, but yeah, these are all theropod dinosaurs. So this is the group that includes Tyrannosaurus rex, for example. But of course, there are many other groups of dinosaurs that look very different. But um, yeah, this would be yeah. the group where you find the ones with the really short forelimbs, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Nizar, how, how many uh, kinds of dinosaurs were there in the past? That's a very right. good question. And we're trying to estimate it. We can use some statistics to calculate approximately. We now have about 800, 800 different species of dinosaurs. Wow. Um, and we're finding new dinosaurs every month and sometimes every week, a new species of wow. dinosaur is described. Um, but it's um, how many have we found? I think we have found less than 10% of all the dinosaurs that we can find. Um, but also, of course, many, many dinosaurs we will never find because not many animals become fossils, right? If you want to become a fossil, um, I hope that I will become a fossil so I can be in a museum one day. <laughs> but <laughs> if you want to become a fossil, you need a lot of luck, right? You need the right conditions. You have to be buried very rapidly. You need to be found. You need to survive millions of years of geological processes, you know, which can crush you or, you know, destroy you in many different ways. So we have to remember that, you know, Every, every fossil we find is a small miracle, right? It's, it's really um, amazing. So we'll never have a complete picture. But we are very fortunate to have all the fossils we do have, right? Um, when we talk about um, human ancestors and relatives, for example, some people say, oh, but we don't have a complete series. We're always missing some. Of course, that's, of course, that's yeah. because becoming a fossil is a very rare event but we are so lucky to have the fossils we do have because they show us some um snapshots of this incredible story and so we will never have the entire story but we will have uh, many of the pages right and um and that that is pretty remarkable if we didn't have fossils we would never know that our planet had um, was home to all of these incredible lost worlds. We wouldn't know it, you know? How would we know? Yeah. There's no book or humans have not realized this. It was science that opened our eyes to this incredible past, right? So it's, um, yeah, becoming a fossil is quite a miracle. But if there are some people watching this and, you know, young people that want to be paleontologists, don't worry. There's still many, many dinosaur skeletons left to find. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so how do fossils actually form? Well, um, ideally, um, in some in some environments, it's easier. So, for example, in Morocco, you have many, you know, trilobites, les trilobites, and ammonites, oh, yeah. and, so on. Um, and they're buried um, in the ocean, right? They need to be rapid, rapidly buried. With dinosaurs, dinosaurs are usually found in river environments or maybe in a lake. Um, and they need to be buried rapidly because if they're not buried rapidly, they will be eaten, right? Scavengers, like today. When an elephant dies, there will be hyenas and lions and many other animals, bacteria. They will destroy everything. So the fossil needs to be buried rapidly um, and gently. Sometimes if there's a big river, it will put the bones all over the place. Maybe um, earthquake. Yes, um, some dinosaurs we know that died. We found some dinosaurs, they were sitting on their eggs like a bird. They were sitting, protecting their eggs, and they died probably in a sandstorm or maybe a sand dune collapsed over them. Um, so sometimes we have that. Some dinosaurs we also have, they were buried in a, 
in volcanic ash. So a volcano erupted and buried them a bit like Pompeii, you know, Pompeii, the, the oh. famous, yeah. Um, so there are different ways to become a fossil, but it has to be rapidly. And typically what happens is over time, the original minerals inside the bone are replaced. And so the, the, the fossils really become like, like rock. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if you are lucky, then they will survive millions of years of changes and acid flowing through rocks and all kinds of things. Um, and they will be found one day. Uh, so did you find fossils with bones, with uh, skeletons, or just uh, uh, fossils uh, as rocks? Well, um, it depends. So the, the human skeleton I showed you, for example, that is just a few thousand years old. So we have the, you know, those, this is much more recent and you can find bones um, with dinosaur fossils. Usually it's, you know, you have all the, the shape and everything, but it has become a different, um, it's a different set of ingredients basically, right? Um, but there are some rare occasions where we still find some original organic material in fossils, which is really amazing. And you can, now we have very sophisticated chemical uh, analyses, which allowed us, allowed us, for example, some of my colleagues at Yale University were able to reconstruct the color of dinosaur eggs. Um, some others were able to reconstruct the color of some dinosaur feathers, but that's only works in exceptional circumstances uh, where some of the original material is still there or some of the color coding compounds, for example. Um, but typically that's not what happens. And in the ChemChem -chem region, we find, you know, real fossils. Um, but, uh, but as I said, they can still tell us a lot about the animals that, that left them behind. Interesting. Uh, so uh, as, as a, paleo a paleontologist, so um, uh, do you plan to do more Spinosaurus hunting in Morocco or in North Africa or elsewhere? Yes. Um, you know, the ChemChem, is always and, a and, 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 and what you didn't find actually <laughs> there are a few things we haven't found yet um that i would like to find things that um Stroma had found in the sahara um you know the german paleontologist and they were destroyed in world war ii there are some things he found that we haven't found yet um we found some things that he hadn't found um, like giant flying reptiles, for example. So, you know, we, 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 we are pretty happy, but there's still many things, there's still many things left out there to, to find. Um, and I have two or three places in, in Morocco where I definitely want to go um, to continue with our field work. I would also like to do the same thing in um, a few other places, uh, Tunisia, um, Egypt, um, I also have plans for other parts of Africa, again, because Africa is so poorly understood. We know so little about Africa's age of dinosaurs. And I think Africa has an incredible story to tell. So we have big plans. It's not the end. Um, there, there are some more discoveries we made um, relating to Spinosaurus. We're going to reveal this year or maybe next year um, and lots of other exciting things. So it's not the end of our work in Morocco or Africa. Interesting. So I hope to see you here in Morocco and uh, dig in uh, some giant uh, pred predators. Uh, and I hope we have a uh, museum here in Morocco and everyone can see. Yeah. So, so yeah. do you think that Morocco will uh, have a museum for these giant creatures? That's a good question. I, I've been trying to make that happen for a long time because it's very, very strange. If yeah. you if you traveled to Egypt right and someone and you said i want to see the 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 mummies and the the pharaohs and so on and the people in egypt told you sorry we don't have a museum you would wow. say are you crazy that's that's impossible yeah. right and of course they have a museum there but it's a bit the same thing in morocco morocco is very famous for fossils and yeah. for me to go there and find out that there is no real museum is yeah. bizarre Strange, yeah. And, and it, is, it is frustrating because you hear about big projects like, oh, we're going to build the Morocco Mall in, in Casablanca yeah. and we're going to build this and that. And you kind of go like, yeah, but 
culture is very important. You know, it's not just malls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, if you go to London, for example, yeah. what would London be without the many museums? Nothing. You know, there's. It's it's very important to have this cultural landscape. And if you go to a city like Casablanca, it's a big city, but it's a cultural desert, right? Desert, there's, yeah. there's almost nothing there. You can go and look at the mosque and that's it, right? There may be two or three places, but there's not really much to do, which is, and the same is true for other places in Africa. If you go to Nigeria, very, very big countries with many, many people, and yet they are left in these cultural deserts. So I think we really need to prioritize this. It's important also so people understand about their own heritage and their own history and all of those things. So the good news is there were some plans in Morocco to build museums. And I know that the, the, the Ministry of Mines in Rabat wanted to build a little museum in their ministry building. Um, a, a small museum has opened recently in Azilal. Um, Azilal. But it's it's an exhibit space. So they have a dinosaur skeleton there of a Moroccan dinosaur, Atlasaurus. But there's no research infrastructure. There's no space to put fossils, real fossils. There's and no... I think there's one also in air food. Yeah, but that one is also this. This is I know that one. It's it's also it's a private one. It's it's someone yeah. that was uh, dealing with fossils and he built his own little thing, right? Yeah. Which is nice, but it's not none of them are real museums. Real museums need um, scientists that work there. Um, they need um, rooms where you can store fossils, you know, many, many fossils. Um, you need a laboratory where people can prepare the fossils, you know, you need all kinds of things. So this is what we really need. And so far it, it hasn't happened, but maybe one day. Uh, yeah, interesting. This is actually a message to decision makers to think uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, building big museum in Morocco for fossils. And, and I'm trying. I all all of my fossils are in the university in Casablanca. I didn't take them and keep them. You know, I, wow. they, I brought, all of them are in Casablanca. And right now, I'm trying to negotiate. I'm trying to put together a big skeleton of a of a dinosaur. And maybe, maybe I can bring it to Morocco, but Morocco also has to help a little bit. They have to give me some space. They have yeah. to, you know, um, do the basics. And it's it's not easy. It's And, and the, the strange thing is some people don't understand how important these museums are. The Natural History Museum in London, for example, or the uh, yeah. American Museum in New York, where you, see, where you can see dinosaurs. These are the top attractions in London and New York, right? It's a big economic value as well for tourism. If there was a if there was yeah. a museum in Morocco with a Spinosaurus, you know, people in Europe and America they love dinosaurs. If you know tourists would would you know if there was such a museum in Casablanca or Rabat or Marrakesh, everybody would want to see it. All the tourists, right? So yeah. it's not even economically. It's really a very easy yeah. decision. Yeah, it's good for uh, tourism. We we local people love the dinosaurs. How about others? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's really a no-brainer. But we'll see. I'm 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 trying to stay optimistic. Yeah, well, yeah, optimistic. Interesting. I hope this message uh, will attract the attention of uh, decision makers and think of um, having a big museum here in Morocco. Why not in Casablanca? It will be an attract an attraction for. Uh, tourists uh, from different parts of the world, especially this is the the, the the earth, this is the place, this is the country of fossils. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, we know that dinosaurs uh, have got different names, Spinosaurus, um, uh, um, uh, Tyrannosaurus, uh, different names. So how uh, are dinosaurs named? Um, that's a good question. Um, Traditionally, we would give them Latin or Greek names, right? Um, so I grew up in Germany, so I also learned some Latin, um, which is useful in science also. Um, so we use Latin or Greek names, and they usually say something about the animal, right? So Spinosaurus Egyptiacus means the spined reptile from Egypt, right? 
Um, or maybe we have some uh, others from Morocco, Moroccanus, Spinosaurus well, Moroccanus. Well, it's probably the same as Spinosaurus aegypticus, but here's the thing. Um, now we, we sometimes use other names. And so, for example, we described a giant flying reptile, a pterosaur from Morocco, and we named it um, Alanca Saharica. And Alanca, Alanca refers to the, the phoenix, the, the Alanca, like the, the, the big phoenix. Maybe, I think uh, th this one, uh, I'm going to show you. It's this one. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. And Saharica refers to the desert. So it's the phoenix of the desert, right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there's another dinosaur from Morocco that is called Atlasaurus, and it refers to the Atlas Mountains, as well as the Atlas from mythology. Um, so, so we sometimes also try to find good names that have a local connection, right? Um, and, and sometimes uh, they, they get their names um, from the, the person who discovered that, for example, Albertosaurus. Well, it's um, sometimes you can name a dinosaur after another scientist, but you, you, you can't name it after yourself. That's seen yeah. as a little, you know. Um, <laughs> but, um, well, Albertosaurus is actually named after the province of Alberta in Canada. Alberta in Canada, so yeah. The, the, the region in Canada. But yes, yeah, some of them are named after people. Um, there is a dinosaur from Niger, for example. It's named Nigersaurus Takiti. And Takiti refers to a French paleontologist who worked in Niger a long time ago, um, Philippe Taquet. So Takiti refers to Taquet, right? Um, so you get, you, you know, sometimes maybe one day someone will name their dinosaur after me, but that's, you know, yeah, I hope to see, uh, to have a uh, Nizar, <laughs> Nizar <-saurus. laughs> Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you know, usually you have to wait until you're 70 or 80 years old or dead. <laughs> or dead. Oh. <laughs> uh, so everything is possible. Why not? Yeah, sure. But, but so we, we are quite flexible with names. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Nizar, as a paleontologist, what's your contribution to society? Well, um, there are different levels of contributions. Um, sometimes it's a very direct contribution. As I said, I mean, I teach future yeah. medical doctors and dentists and so on. So, you know, training them in anatomy. So there are many um, health professionals in Michigan, for example, um, that learned all of their human anatomy in my class, right? That's that's one way to say oh, a direct contribution. But then, of course, as I said, we're we're reconstructing the history of life on Earth, which is an incredible story. But also, you know, when you look at the big challenges today, climate change, um, biodiversity loss, how can we understand these things? Some people say that we are now in a mass extinction, right? Where many, many organisms go extinct. How do we know what a mass extinction is? From paleontology. Paleontologists identified big mass extinctions in the past. And so if we want to understand big changes on our planet, like climate change, we have to look at the past, right? So I mentioned earlier on that the Sahara was a big river system, right? When Spinosaurus was alive, our planet was a hothouse planet, very high sea levels, no ice on the poles, right? It was a world of global warming. So if we want to understand how these things happen and what, what the consequences are for animals and plants over thousands or, and millions of years, we have to travel back in time. So paleontologists give us the information we need to understand our planet today and in the future, right? Yeah. So that's another uh, big, big contribution. Um, and then, of course, you know, we understand anatomy, the, the limits of anatomy, you know? If we didn't have paleontology, we might think the biggest creature that can fly is, you know, the biggest birds we know today. But we know there are flying creatures with a wingspan of 10 meters, 10 meters, that's like a small airplane. How is yeah. that possible? How can these things work? And sometimes the study of these things can have other consequences. I know a colleague from of mine in the US, he works on these flying reptiles. And he said there was some interest from the US military because they were interested in how can these things take off the ground and fly? And, you know, could we maybe build a drone that can do things that these animals can do? Mm -hmm. So 
you never know. You know, science is unpredictable. Um, scientists make contributions all the time, and some of them are worth a lot of money, and others aren't. You know, um, but they are all important because you can't measure everything in money, of course. Um, yeah. Now that we want the COVID vaccine, the the some of the big discoveries that allowed us to use messenger RNA for vaccines, for example, were discovered by a guy who was studying the water in uh, Yellowstone National Park in America. And nobody gave him funding, but he found um, many of the key um, ingredients that we need to make the vaccines today. You know, so sometimes these connections are not, you know, you can never really predict those things in science. Yeah. So I think paleontology makes some very direct contributions, but even if they're not so direct, you know, all scientific research is important. Um, and what kind of a world would it be if we didn't have this knowledge, right? You could say, why do we need to know about Mars? Why do we need to know about the universe? But our existence would be so much smaller and it would be yeah. mediocre if we didn't know about all of these incredible things that inspire us, you know, to realize, for example, how small we are in space um, or with paleontology, how small we are in time. Yeah, and, and of course, it, uh, if we don't study that, it will not help us uh, change our actions in the future. Maybe yeah. we, will, we will go extent if we don't take into consideration these things. Well, one of the things I can tell you from paleontology, no species lasts forever yeah. and you know we can learn a lot from studying paleontology to understand what which species survive longest and okay. why and how um because there will be a world without humans in the future we don't know when it's going to happen but we should try to make it last <laughs> as long as we can because right now we are doing a very good job um you know, pushing for our own, for our own extinction <laughs> um, yeah. with nuclear weapons, with, you know, um, overfishing our oceans, destroying rainforests. Some animals will survive, right? We already know which ones, you know, les cafards <laughs> and so on, <laughs> cockroaches. Yeah. They will survive. But, but we depend on our planet on so many different ways. Um, so, yes, we can learn a lot from paleontology and other sciences, um, to to hopefully you know um change uh, our behavior <laughs> change our behavior and survive for longer and you know now everybody's talking about climate change a few years ago if you told someone oh i'm trying to reconstruct the climate of the jurassic period from the age of dinosaurs 150 million years ago they would say oh who cares what a waste of money yeah. you know and now oh everybody God. wants to know. They say, tell me everything about the climate from 150 million years ago. We need to understand everything about the climate. So, you know, science, that's how science works. And studying history is very interesting. Yeah. It helps yeah. a lot. In, yeah. It's very important, you know. Yeah. So in this vein, Dr. Nizar, so what would your advice be to someone who wants to study dinosaurs in the future? Well, there are two major pathways. One is to study the geological sciences, um, and the other one is to study the biosciences, right? Biology, zoology, I anatomy. Um, or you can combine both. I got my undergraduate degree in the UK, and I studied geology and biology. Um, and it's, you know, you need um, a lot of flexibility um, in your career because... You know, you might have to do your PhD in another country, you know, um, and you need to be passionate. Don't do it if you're only 60% motivated. You need to be 110% motivated. <laughs> Energetic. <laughs> um, yes. It's not like, a, you know, if you just want to be, you know, and it's true, like, you know, you can do a traditional safe, you know, like in Morocco, People say, like, you can be pharmacien, you can be this, you can be that. Exactly. But if you want to be really, for any science, if you want to really push the boundaries, if you really want to change the world, um, then you need to take some risks, right? So you have to be prepared to take some risks. Um, 
and and work internationally what you said at the beginning about you know learning english and opening your mind is very important because maybe your opportunity will be to do a phd in australia you know and then do a postdoc in germany and then you know but it's it's you know for me it wasn't always the easiest path but what an exciting life right it's now of course i have my my job and everything and it's 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 a a wonderful profession but it's not easy so you can take one of these two pathways but the most important thing is really to you know be open to you know pursuing your dreams in in many different directions and ways Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim. We are right in one hour and we still have some questions, especially uh, about evolution. And I think let's move on to talk about evolution. This is uh, this amazing uh, topic. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what do we mean by evolution and what, what do you think about uh, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution? What does well, it say in general? Yeah, briefly well, you can state that. Darwin's um, Darwin is of course one of the greatest scientists um, in in the history of science. He is, um, and he was not just a great scientist; he was also a pretty uh, incredible person, very modest. He was he was quite scared to publish um, his ideas at what? the time um, because he doesn't like confrontation or didn't like confrontation, and you know, he stayed away from much of these these public debates that happened after he. Um, Um, shared his incredible discoveries. Essentially, it's based on some very simple um, facts. We know, for example, that um, resources in, in, in nature are limited, right? So there is a competition for resources. We know that animals usually have more offspring than can survive. So there's a certain level of competition. We know that organisms also um, change over time, right? When Darwin came up with his idea that of, of natural selection, which is essentially to make it very easy, we do selection all the time, artificial selection. When we select dog breeds, for example, we do artificial selection. We can select for a long, long snout or short snout and long fur. We do it with plants all the time. Uh, the difference is just that with natural selection, nature is doing the selecting, right? Some individuals have a certain uh, advantage which they will pass on to their offspring, right? Um, so all of these are facts, right? This is, um, but Darwin put it all together and it was um, a scientific revolution to understand that species were not static, they were changing. Um, And of course, other people also at the time made these incredible discoveries that, you know, some organisms had gone extinct. At Darwin's time, people thought that all species were there forever, had been, you know, put there and just stayed there. When they realized that there were extinct animals that lived on this planet, that, of course, gave a whole, gave a whole other dimension to, to evolution. Um, Darwin didn't, didn't know much about the mechanisms in genetics, So Darwin, um, Darwin's ideas were st are still correct, but he didn't know how some of these things worked. So um, now, of course, with the science of genetics, we understand exactly how evolution works at the most fundamental level of DNA, right? Um, so some people sometimes say, oh, Darwin has been proven wrong and Darwin is, that's, that's not, that's not the, the right way to put it. Um, Darwin lived in a time before genetics, right? So of yeah. course we have learned so much more, we have expanded, but Darwin gave us the first real insight into a, a mechanism, natural selection that could account for the incredible diversity of life we see on earth. And of course, from there, we have built many, many, many other layers. Um, and if Darwin could see all these things today, he would be amazed to see all the insights we have from, from genetics, from fossils, from, you know, if he saw the fossil whales and early humans, he would be amazed. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the foundation of all of biology 
And what people often don't understand is if you, you know, some people say, oh, it's just biology. Um, evolution is also consistent with, you know, everything we know from physics and the, the history of our planet and chemistry. And, you know, it's, it's so central to, to, to life sciences and it connects to all these other sciences. It's, it's crazy to think that it generates so much con controversy but a lot of the controversy comes from our feeling of specialness. We like to feel very, very special. <laughs> and I think yeah. in, in some countries, one of my colleagues was asked to do an exhibit on dinosaurs in the Gulf. And I'm not going to say where exactly, but he was supposed to do that. And they told him, we want to see dinosaurs and all this story of animals and so on. And so basically the story of evolution. But they told him, you can show, show all these animals, but no humans. Don't connect anything to humans. <laughs> and that's one of the problems you have in some parts of the world where people say, yeah, we kind of accept this and that and this, and that. But, you know, but humans are. But of course, we know. Um, sometimes you, sometimes now, you create. Now with genetics, we can, yeah, now with genetics, we, we can even measure how similar, similar we are to other animals. Um, yeah. And that's why, you know, Today, it's, it has become impossible to, to be intellectually opposed to the central idea of in, in biology, right, which is evolution. But um, unfortunately, again, for many people, there's a lot of disinformation and, you know, fake news and, and all kinds of, um, you know, online content that is very misleading. Yeah. So we know, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, that one of the main components of uh, Darwin's theory of evolution is uh, natural selection, or what is called, I think, in Arabic, intiqat yeah. tabi'i. Uh, so how does natural selection work? Well, natural selection, um, I think one of the things that people often get wrong about natural selection is they often think of this idea um, that we call survival of the fittest, right? Survival of the fittest was not a term that was coined by Darwin. It was actually coined by Herbert Spencer, an economist. Um, and survival of the fittest doesn't mean, many people think, oh, it means the strongest or meanest or fiercest, you know, and they say like, that's not how it works at all. So fittest, maybe we can talk about the adaptation to the yeah. environment. Yes, well, fittest ultimately means the, the best way to measure fitness is reproductive output. So if you have a lot of offspring, that's the best measure of fitness. This is our measure of fitness in biology. And if you have um, an advantageous uh, mutation, it will be selected for. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, people often think of evolution as having a lot to do with random events. It's not random at all. Natural selection is the opposite of random. What is random is mutations. So mutations happen randomly. Most mutations are negative. They're deleterious. They're not good. But sometimes a mutation gives you a small advantage. And if this advantage is good in your environment, it will be selected for, naturally selected for. So for example, we can look at something very complex like the human eye, right? And people say, how can you get something so complex? through yeah. random chance. It's not random chance. It's very small, gradual steps over millions of years. So for some organisms, just the ability to detect light can be an advantage, right? Just, just light or no light, very as simple as it gets, right? Because it might alert you to the, the shadow of a predator or whatever, right? I'm just giving you a simple example. And, you, and we can see this in anatomy and also in fossils. Um, these complex structures happen one small change at a time, but every stage is functional, right? So, you know, half an eye is better than 49% of an eye, so to speak, right? And, and we can see many different types of eyes that have evolved in different groups of animals. And so this is essentially what, what happens. It's the mix, the raw material is mutations and they are random, but natural selection selects those individuals and those genes ultimately that confer a certain survival advantage and, um, and these are passed on. 
Um, it's obviously the reality is more complicated. Sometimes um, uh, there are um, things like genetic drift where some organisms might just die even if they have an advantageous mutation. You know, that it could be like a little beetle that has an advantageous mutation and someone steps on it and it's gone, right? <laughs> so the reality is obviously a little more complex, but um, that's ultimately what natural selection is, selecting for these um, genes that convey a certain advantage in a certain environment. And we can see that on so many different levels that um, it's astonishing that this basic principle is even controversial because we can see it all around us. And by the way, evolution happens all the time. Why do we have to worry about these new variants of, of um, SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the virus that causes COVID? They evolve. Yeah. Some of them have, what is the advantage in these viruses? The advantage for them now is if they can evade the vaccine mechanism. If they can evade this vaccine mechanism, they will spread. You know, now the British variant has spread in Europe because it is better um, yeah. uh, in the current uh, ecosystem, if you like, than the previous version of the virus. And so viruses are doing this all the time. Viruses are evolving. This is natural selection in action, right? So um, we can see it all around us. That's the reason why we always need to get another flu shot every year, because the yeah. viruses evolve. Yeah, this is maybe what, what's happening nowadays when we see uh, vaccines. So the development of vaccines. Why do we develop vaccines? It's because maybe we are afraid of <laughs> extension. Um, well, that's that we're yeah. certain. So, yeah, we, we help ourselves to adapt to the environment. Imagine that we we we, we didn't develop vaccines. Maybe mm, humans uh, uh, could have uh, gone extinct, right? Well, you know, vaccines. I think humans would probably not have gone completely extinct, but obviously vaccines have helped us um, prevent huge loss of life. The reason why there are so many humans on the planet today is because of science, because we were able to uh, reduce greatly the number of people dying of, of diseases, diseases that killed countless people in the past, right? Um, I think... One of the things that the virus has certainly done, I think, is again reminded us that we're not as powerful as we like to think. You know, all of our economies, all of the big things, our travel, everything has been um, stopped almost because of a tiny little virus without a brain, without any thoughts, just a replicating virus that looks for weaknesses and that continues to evolve through natural selection to in an arms race it's like you know when there was the cold war and there was an arms race between the us and russia this is the same or the soviet union i should say this is the same thing it's a race between vaccines science and a virus a very dangerous enemy because of natural selection yeah um, maybe dinosaurs also suffered uh, different diseases right yes of course and, and all uh, animals do um, one of the things we also know is that, um, and I think people in, 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 in Morocco sometimes forget that um, when I've met many people there that are very worried about, you know, animals and dogs and, you know, whatever. And they say like, oh, you know, they give you some disease or something. We give many diseases to other animals. One of the reasons when you go to look at the gorillas, for example, in Rwanda, um, they are very close to us genetically, very, very close. Um, and humans have to wear face masks because it's because we infect them with just a simple cold for them can be deadly, can be, you know, it kills them. Yeah. So humans also give, you know, viruses to other animals. It goes in all directions. We are not cleaner or, you know, better. Viruses don't really care. They can go from a bat to a human and from a human to a pig and from a pig to, a, you know, there are all kinds of, of, of um, things that can happen. And so I think it's, it's important to realize, again, that we are not, uh, you know, apart from the rest of nature. We are part of it, you know, oh, wow. and, and that's why viruses can jump from one species to the next. Um, and, you know, to give you one interesting example, um, there are some 
diseases that we can give chimpanzees, for example, that are absolutely deadly for them. Uh, but chimpanzees have um, some mutations that make them um, uh, safe from some diseases that are very dangerous for us, for example, right? So it's, um, you know, there's a lot we can learn from other animals when it comes to understanding viruses and how they work and so on. We really have to take a, um, an interspecies approach. We have to look at all the species, right? And I think people are understanding that now, especially with COVID. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we can say, uh, Dr. Desart, that evolution is not a random process. No, it's, it's the opposite of random. Mutations are random, but that's just the raw material. But evolution itself works very, very precisely, systematically, little step by little step um, through selection in the same way that, as I said, artificial selection, we do it, you know, and you can yeah. turn a wolf into a chihuahua. You know, we know we can make big changes. The only difference is that in this case, it's the environment nature if you like that's why it's called na so, natural selection making the selecting so if it's not random so we think that um, humans uh, are influencing the process of evolution yes we are still in a process of evolution i mean there's a lot of um there are different rates of evolution different changes but um there are all kinds of things that are still changing um and Sometimes people ask me what what is going to happen next in in humans. That's very hard to predict. That's very speculative. Yeah. But um, you can see all kinds of changes. In fact, here's one interesting thing: um, the brains of Homo sapiens. Uh, by the way, you know one one of the oldest, some of the oldest skulls of Homo sapiens are actually from Morocco, right? Um, if you look at just our species, you can see over time the brains. Um, in our ancestors, the brains were smaller and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But then now, um, over the last few tens of thousands of years, the brains are getting smaller again. So some Homo sapiens and even some other species like Neanderthals, Neanderthalian, Neanderthals yeah. they had, some of them had bigger brains than we had. Um, so brain size, for example, has been changing. Um, there are all kinds of things that change, but evolution happens on vast time scales, right? Yeah. With wolves, we, we can see it very rapidly going from a wolf to a dog, but really big changes from a dinosaur to a bird or from an amphibian to, a, to an early reptile and so on. Those things play out over millions of years, and we have a very hard time understanding these numbers, right? And that's why paleontology is so important. It helps us look at these major developments in the history of life. We know that fins, like in fish, fish fins, in some fish uh, became digits. And we digits, can yeah. develop developmental biology. We know the genes that do this. We know how they change. It's really remarkable. Um, but, you know, the only way you can really understand this is if you travel back in time and, and now also you can use the, the power of genetics and developmental biology. But all of these things are extremely well documented now. Yeah. So uh, uh, in this vein, uh, Doctor, we know that evolution is not a random process. We know that uh, evolution is still happening, right? Yes. Uh, so what is, what is the major goal uh, of evolution? Well, here's the thing. Evolution doesn't have a goal. Yeah. Does it know where <laughs> it is taking us? No. And that depends on many factors. And it also partly depends on, on the environment where the selection occurs, right? So I mentioned, for example, how viruses flourish in certain environments um, and not so much in others. But there's all kinds of things that um, e evolution doesn't... Um, doesn't happen in anticipation of something else. So, for example, um, animals do not evolve wings and say, maybe in 10,000 years, this is going to be useful. Whatever happens has to be useful in the environment where the selection is happening. And so, um, you know, some of the things that could happen in the future, we're, we're, we are now living in a world that is very different because it's only partially natural. Our our um, species has become, to a certain extent, also 
you know, we can change, we know genetic modification. We don't know where that's going to take us. We might, you know, we do things that are not really natural anymore. And maybe, you know, here's, here's my phone. Maybe someone, you know, humans are using their fingers in very different ways now. You can see maybe in a few thousand years, our fingers are going to be much longer and different if we keep, you know, um, there are all kinds of things that can happen, but it's very speculative and very hard to predict. It depends on so many factors. And so um, that's one of the things that, that we, we, we learn, you know, evolution is not, does not have an ultimate goal, but but the things that matter in evolution are not things like having a big brain, for example. We think this is the ultimate goal, but it's not. Um, if you want to say, what is the most successful species? As I said, I think we will go extinct, maybe in part because of our own actions, right? Not very impressive. <laughs> um, the cockroaches have been around for a very long time and they will be around after us. From an evolutionary point of view, they are going to be more successful. You know what I mean? It's or or yeah. some some very simple. So it's not the measure of success in 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 science in, in biology is not necessarily oh I built this big tower and I I, have, I went to the moon. Um, so the way we would measure success and evolution is quite different. We are a very successful species in some ways. We have dominated the world in very short, in a very short amount of time. We are everywhere now and we are doing, we're really pushing our knowledge um, to, you know, incredible new heights. But again, that's very different of how you would measure long-term success. And I think now we are at a moment where we can decide, are we going to be a successful species or are we going to be like a virus that came on our planet yeah. and killed a lot of life on planet Earth? Um, for many, many other animals, humans were not a good success story. They destroyed their habitats. They overfished their oceans. They took up all the resources. A bit like when you have um, locusts coming, you know, when they come in huge numbers and take everything. We have to make sure that we don't treat our planet like a big field. Um, with locusts, right? We have to make sure that we um, change <laughs> directions. And so maybe we can become a successful species. But right now, it's still a very mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, so I think that um, evolution doesn't tell us about uh, our uh, role in this life. Just it, happen it happens like that without, uh, for no purpose. Yes. So don't you think that this could uh, tell us, uh, could push us to talk about the existence maybe of God? Well, that's kind of almost, um, you know, outside of the, the, the field of science, right? It's, it's ultimately, we know that humans for, have always tried to find this bigger, a narrative or, or story, right? <clears throat> and there's so many, so many. Um, and, and many of them have beautiful stories and, you know, and similarly, um, uh, even Neanderthals probably had some belief in the afterlife. There's some evidence that they're putting flowers and other ceremonial things uh, when they're burying people, right? So, um, so there are all kinds of, of, of stories that, that humans have, have come up with um, to explain the world and everything around them. But ultimately, I think for, as a, from a scientific point of view, of course, um, we, we look at, at, at things that are testable, verifiable. Um, so I know that... Morocco was home to this giant sailback dinosaur. I have the bones. We can do all kinds of things with those bones. Um, but when you're making claims that kind of lie outside of science, that's a whole other world, right? There's nothing testable about it. And I think people also have to um, understand these, these differences, you know, because sometimes people try to make it scientific and they try to say, oh, but in my holy book, there's this thing that's mentioned in science. They're trying to make it to make it legitimate Scientific, by, yeah. by connecting it to science. And that's just not, that never works. Believe me, I've seen it many times. It's yeah. not, that's not, and, and, they're, and they're very selective. And they're like, oh, I found this mention and maybe this means this or, you know, life began in water and this. No, that's, that's not, I think they have to understand that those are two very 
separate things, right? Um, there is everything we know about the history of our planet um, from astronomy and physics and astrophysics and biology and so on. Um, and that's a very different, you know, um, area, right? Um, ultimately, these big fundamental questions are, um, you know, in, in a place that's kind of almost not accessible in some ways. Um, we know that life started almost pretty much by itself. If you have the right mix of chemicals, some simple compounds self-assemble. We can we we found that out. This was an amazing amazing discovery over the last few decades. Um, so we used to think that there has to be some magic involved, right? But we now know that for life, there is no need to invoke some um, big puppet player that kind of directs life. But when it comes to the bigger questions like the universe and so on, that's, you know, going back to the big bang, right? And, and, and that's a whole other world. But again, I think we always have to make sure that we don't um, water down science or vice versa by, by forgetting that really, you know, what scientists do is based on testable hypotheses, theories, and so on that, that we can see. The rest, as I said, is there's a long, long history of mythology and, and stories and all kinds of things, um, not just in humans, but, but also in, in some of our closest extinct relatives. Yeah, uh, what, what is fascinating is that when you said that uh, uh, the major goal of evolution, that evolution doesn't have a specific goal, uh, yeah. here uh, a question raised uh, abruptly is that, uh, so there should be a kind of power which could uh, uh, orient, guide, or push, or let's say, mode this this uh, evolution uh, into specific uh, directions. And here, maybe it's not testable scientifically, actually. So maybe we can talk about theories or hypotheses, maybe of the existence of a god. For example, uh, dinosaurs d existed before, I think, humans, right? Yeah. So imagine that we still have, we still live with dinosaurs in that giant predatory dinosaurs. I think a human uh, could have an uh, extent. That's why humans, especially Homo sapiens, came or appeared later. So which yeah. means here there is something what is what is called maybe uh, we can say uh, skillful, clever, uh, someone uh, well, I don't know. Well, power. let, me, let yeah. me put it this way: there, there are a couple of things here. Um, the first one is, if you just if the goal is to make humans, right? You would just make humans. You probably wouldn't yeah. wait billions of years and then make them go through all the suffering. Um, as I said, little mammals were around in the time of the dinosaurs that didn't really have a chance. Um, you could just say, "Hey, let's get going with humans. This is all about humans. Let's just let's just get started." You wouldn't wait billions of years. You know, our planet is 4.6 billion, 4.6 billion years old. And for much of this time, nothing happens. And then for many, many hundreds of millions of years, um, things are very simple. You know, it's just, you know, very, very simple life. Um, every, so when you look at that, there, that's, that's, I would say, the opposite. I would say there is no indication of someone steering the car. It's just, you know, you go like, if this is about this, you know, it's like, hey, we've already wasted, you know, billions of years. Maybe we should get yeah. started the main menu, you know? No, it's just, you know. The other thing I would say is um, in anatomy, I often tell my students, if, if you were an engineer and you built the human body, you would be fired because it has so many mistakes. Some people often think, oh, the human body is so perfect. And so it's not. Um, not, yeah. Ask people about their back pain, you know, 80% of Americans will have back pain. And that's a consequence of walking on two legs, right? But it comes with all, it's a, it's a evolutionary compromise, right? There's some, also we have dwarfs. Yeah. And, and some disadvantages, um, our knees, the knees are terribly designed um, from an anatomical and evolutionary perspective. We know exactly why knees look the way they do, but if you had to start from scratch, you would never come up with this because if you ever had a problem with your knee, you know, it just doesn't get away, <laughs> go away. The knees are terribly designed. So, and there are many, many other examples. So I think 
making an argument from from again from science to say oh but our bodies are so amazing or you know um maybe there was some, it, the, the 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 history of life and our own anatomy doesn't have a signature of some you know kind of sophisticated engineer to put it that way you know but it has all the signs of you know um of of you know uh neutral <laughs> to put it this way evolution which doesn't care one way or another right <laughs> which is just you know it 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 takes the path it does and 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 our world is quite cruel you know you mentioned the world before vaccines why would you make a world with you know terrible diseases like worms that eat the eyes of children and i mean terrible terrible diseases and all of these things show a world that is just as you would expect it if it's you know it's us and the universe there's no you know what i mean if if you wanted to say well let's make a world that is good for people it it's it's a pretty brutal world we have made it better better through science because we can now protect ourselves from many things but there are no signs in our lives or our bodies or our evolutionary history that suggests some wise you know big wisdom guidance you know so that's why i'm saying it's really best to keep those things separate because yeah. in science i think it never really ends well when people try to say oh maybe this is because i can always tell you there's many many horror stories and as i said the engineer would be fired <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you have mentioned, Dr. Ibrahim, that we are part of this world, right? So we are not alone. No man is an island. <laughs> yes. Uh, so do you think are uh, all uh, all species related? Well, we know that all species are related. Um, certainly now we know it for sure because of genetics. Um, genetics. Yeah. Some are very distantly related to us. And, uh, you know, humans are very special in, in, in many ways. Um but we are all related, which is an amazing thing to know and, and appreciate. And I think it makes us, it should make us care more about the environment and our planet. Um, but that we know. And it's, you know, going back to the um, kind of universal common ancestor is such a complicated web. It's impossible to really comprehend. And it takes all of the branches of science to, to really understand the very beginnings of life itself as I mentioned earlier on, but, um, but it's not, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we can even try to understand some of those things is, is pretty amazing, you know, because again, without science, we would be, you know, we wouldn't know any of this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think there is a, a common sense, maybe, um, an idea that, um, uh, shared among uh, people that we evolved from monkeys or we share the, the same uh, or common ancestor. So did we really evolve from monkeys or different, let's say, an, uh, ancestors? Well, people often say this thing where they say, um, including in the United States, where there's a big problem with the evolution in some of the conservative states like, like Texas or Alabama. Um, and people say like, oh, I don't believe that, you know, we evolved from chimpanzees, right? And that's no biologist would say that because as I said earlier on, we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. So yes. we have a common ancestor. Chimpanzees had just as much time to evolve as we did. They're not less evolved or monkeys are less evolved. They are very good at what they are doing. Um, and we are very good at what we are doing. We um, share a common ancestor. So that common ancestor we now know um, from fossils, as you would expect, would have, um, when we go on the human line, you see a mosaic of features, certain things that we see in other great apes in the anatomy, like longer arms, like, like um, um, and in, in some early forms, uh, a smaller head that looks more like with a chimp, sized brain in some ancestors like the famous Lucy um, Australopithecus uh, specimen. Um, so you see this mosaic of features. Um, but uh, so, so yes, we did not evolve from monkeys or, or apes that or are apes. around today. That's just not true. We have a, sh we share a common ancestor. Yeah, because if we, if, if humans evolved from apes, <laughs> then why are uh, there yeah. still apes? Yeah. yeah, that's that's a that's a yeah. 
so some human, you might find online on some, you know, but it's not, it has nothing to do with science. Yeah, because uh, as it is said in Darija, uh, yeah. this is from Iraqis maybe, yeah, but yeah. Uh, as Dr. Nizar Brahim, and not only you uh, who uh, said that, even Darwin, Darwin didn't say that we evolved from apes. No. Because this is no, misunderstanding, be... yeah. No, it's one of those things that I think, because people, you know, I think it's very important to make sure that people are scientifically literate in, in any country. And unfortunately, yeah. that's not the case, right? Many people, and we see this now, why is there a lot of vaccine hesitancy, for example, because people don't understand the science? Yeah. Why are there so many problems with climate change? Because people don't understand the science. Yeah. And now it's we can see this problem because um, it our survival depends on it, and it's a bit too late. We really have to change things. And it's the same thing for evolution. In some countries, they say, oh, we're not going to teach evolution because it's too controversial. And then people are vulnerable to believing these nonsense stories like, you know, oh, we evolved from chimpanzees and nobody would say that. No scientist would say that. So unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah. So in, in, in this vein, uh, how did humans first appear on Earth? Well, we know that there are a number of different uh, hominids. So that's the group that includes um, uh, us and our, our ancestors, um, we know that we all came from Africa. Uh, so in that sense, we are all Africans. And, <laughs> many... and I think we're all Moroccans. <laughs> well, that's, that was one of the headlines I saw in, when they found like, some of these um, yeah, homes. Because they found the, the first human, I think, uh, in, in Morocco, course, right? Yes, but we can, there are some, there are similar age in other parts of the continent, but really you can go back, of course, much further and this is really where our origin lies in, in Africa. And we know from, from fossils, again, we can see migrations out of Africa. There are different types of humans at some point that were coexisting. That's another thing that's remarkable. You know, there's Homo sapiens, there were Neanderthals, they met, you know, two different types of humans that met. Um, there were dwarf humans we know of dwarf. from Indonesia, tiny little humans, um, yeah. and, and a number of other species. And so the environments, this reflects the environments they lived in. Neanderthals lived in, in many cases in colder climates. So they had adaptations for survival in cold climates. They had more a stockier built, more massive bones. Um, they had larger noses, which warms up the air that you, you take in, for example. Um, whereas Homo sapiens in Africa had very different adaptations, more slender bodies for hotter climates and so on. Um, we know that humans were for or our human ancestors spent quite a lot of time in um you know not as top predators uh they would often look for for um carcasses uh you know scavenging dead animals that other predators had killed um but there's some key events um including um uh, tool use uh although we know that chimpanzees also make tools um, and even gorillas do. So we used to think this is unique to humans. It's not. But of course, humans made some very sophisticated tools for hunting and fishing and all kinds of other things, which was a consequence of bipedal walking, being able to use our hands. And it's, it's a complicated web of events. But um, one other key event was, of course, fire and being able to cook our food. Um, when you cook your food, you can get a lot more out of it. It's almost like it's pre-digested and yeah. you can get a lot more protein content out, which helps you grow a bigger brain and it becomes a, you know, a kind of um, uh, a circle where, you know, these innovations also help in, 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 in a lot of our evolutionary milestones, right? Um, the human story is, is, um, is a really remarkable one because there was nothing that really predestined humans to take over the world. In fact, humans went through a, a bottleneck, a genetic bottleneck. We know that at some point, the human population on earth was very low, about 10,000 individuals. And if they had gone extinct, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Um, yeah. But they, they recovered. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at the arrival of humans in different parts of the world. Um, one of the things we see is that there are extinction events happening uh, when humans arrive in some parts of the world, like in Australia or North America, these were parts of the world where humans were absent. 
in Africa, the big animals got used to humans, right? So they're kind of, you know, elephants and, and, and rhinos and so on. But in other parts of the world, all the big animals were killed uh, and disappeared when humans arrived, probably mostly because of humans. There may have been other factors, but, you know. So I think humans also have a certain, um, uh, you know, um, aspect that is quite brutal and, and, and is maybe one key to our um, uh, success, right? It's, uh, it's, you know, there's a certain ruthlessness. Um, there's also a kind side. We have this kind of two-faced um, personality as a species, I guess, and we see it also in the world, we, in the way we treat the world around us. But um, it's a very, I mean, you could spend a whole day talking about the, the yeah. all the steps yeah. that led to our success story. So I, I think there was an assumption that the first human w was very tall. Uh, is it true? Uh, no. Um, no. Yeah. No. The, if you go to the very first um, forms, things like Australopithecus and, and so on, they are quite, quite small, actually. Uh, when you get to Homo sapiens or Homo neanderthalensis, they're, you know, comparable to modern humans in size. Um, some of the early ones were quite tall and slender, but not like extremely tall. I think that's more based again on, on legends of giants and, yeah. and, and, you know, and there are many, again, mythological and religious stories about giant people that lived in yeah. the past. In fact, when some of the first dinosaur bones were found, some people thought that those were the bones of giant humans. Um, they were mentioned in the Bible and, and so on. But then they found out they were actually bones of giant reptiles, the dinosaurs. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so uh, how, how the, 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 do you think that uh, modern humans and Neanderthals uh, are related? So how are they related? Well, I mean, we belong to the same genus, Homo, right? Genus. We are Homo sapiens. They are Homo neanderthalensis, so we're certainly yeah. closely related. We know from some discoveries that there was even some interbreeding because we um, Europeans have some Neanderthal genes um, uh, and there's some, I, I took a sample um, for, a, for the National Geographic Genographic Project so I could even see what percentage of Neanderthal DNA I still have. Um, so we know that not only are we close to them, um, there was some exchange of genes and we can even see what these Neanderthal genes do. Um, and they, that only happened in the parts of the world where these two groups met. So there are other parts of the world where there are no Neanderthal genes because Neanderthals didn't live there. So again, it's just one of the consequences of the evolutionary story. Uh, but we can even see now what do these genes do? You know, do they help us in certain things or not? It's really interesting if you want to find out what you know, Neanderthal genes do. You can you can find out some information online, but it's um, quite quite amazing. Uh, so, uh, can we say that Neanderthals uh, uh, went extinct, or we we still have there? Well, they went extinct, but of course, some of the genes still live in us. But then, of course, we have genes. That's the remarkable thing. Um, you know, species go extinct, but ultimately species, organisms are just vessels for genes, right? It's, 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 and, and so when you look at evolution, ultimately it's like rivers of DNA through time, right? And um, when you look at humans, for example, um, a lot of the basic um, anatomical architecture and the genes um, that I used to talk to you now are still present in fish. You know, you can you can see this this ancient evolutionary heritage in our genes, in our development, uh, developmental biology, in our in our anatomy. And um, I think, um, you know, we we still have, for example, we still have genes for um, a yolk sac. You know, that's the the yellow part of the egg, the right? Egg, the egg, we yeah. still have that. Why? Why would we have? Um, these genes, they're switched off, but they're still there. Um, and that's a, a, a leftover from our egg laying past. And that's hundreds of millions of years ago, uh, our ancestors were still laying eggs and we still have those genes. They're like gene fossils, if you like. Fossils, yeah. So even in genetics, we can see all of these key steps. It's not just about bones or, you know, some people think we just know that from bones. And even in our genes, we can still see this very ancient history. 
Yeah. So uh, can we say that uh, evolution stops once uh, a species has become a species? Well, it doesn't stop. That's the thing. When, when we de define species, a species is really an artificial construct that we use to talk about an animal because evolution is a continuum, right? So um, to make this very simple, um, just think of Homo sapiens today, right? And we'll just, to make it very simple, we say that um, the form that comes before us is Homo erectus, right? There might have been another species in between, but we'll just say Homo erectus, right? Um, so if you put Homo sapiens individuals in rows for each generation, so you have one generation, then the previous, the previous, the previous, and you just go back in time, right? Yeah. At some point, you will get to Homo erectus. But when you look at the two individuals where you want to draw the line, they look the same, essentially, right? And so you can't really say, when we look at fossils, we can say, oh, this skull is probably Homo erectus and this one is Homo sapiens. But really, it's a very gradual process. And because it's a gradual process, there's no clear line that separates one from the other, right? We just use these labels, but that's not how evolution works. It's a continuous process. Um, and, and we just use species names as useful labels. So we know what we're talking about. But in reality, if you had every individual of a species going back through time, it would be very hard to draw these lines. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Nizar Rahim, thank you very much for uh, your time, for the amazing, uh, informative presentation and interview. You have answered many, many questions. Actually, we are running two hours. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's amazing, actually. And uh, I have taken the most often cited questions uh, in evolution, paleontology, anatomy, dinosaurs, uh, the, the importance of science, the importance of English uh, for science, for researchers, for future Moroccan researchers, and of course, uh, uh, the international uh, uh, people who, jo who are joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, uh, before uh, we conclude, so I think uh, we come to the end of this webinar, I would like to open the door for the virtual uh, audience to ask their questions, but of course questions that have not been covered. Just, I think, 10 or 15 minutes maximum, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, we, uh, so uh, now I'm... Uh, uh, we will uh, open the door for questions, uh, even in Arabic or French or I think even German. You can ask uh, your questions. Uh, so quickly before we conclude this webinar. So uh, I, I was talking Darija. اللي عنده شيء سؤال على الموضوع ديال علم التشريح علم الحفريات وكل ما يتعلق أو نظريات التطور أو للموضوع الحالي اللي سنتحدث عليه اليوم مع دكتور نزار. اللي خدينا من الوقت ديالو بزاف اليوم ويعني اكثر من ساعتين ديال الوقت وتنشكره مره اخرى على قبول الدعوه اللي يكون معنا في هذا اللقاء الخاص والمباشر اكسكلوسيف اكشلي انترفيو ويذ يو دكتور نزار سو اف يو هاف كويستشنز بليز بوست ذيم هير دايركتلي اي ريد باي ذا وي اول كوماندز اند ثانك يو فور جوينينغ اس اللي عنده اي تساؤل حول الموضوع اللي كنهضروا عليه اليوم اللي هو العلم الحفريات والتشريح يمكن له يحط التساؤل ديالو الان وغادي يكون بطبيعه الحال سعيد الدكتور نزار باش يجاوب على الاسئله ديالكم هو دبيس سو هابي تو انسر اول اوف يور كويستشنز الا كاين شي تساؤل مرحبا مع العلم انني تقريبا حطيت جميع الاسئله اللي يمكن لها تناول في هذا الموضوع تنظن اكثر من 20 سؤال اللي تمت الاجابه عنهم وتطرق لهم اليوم مع ضيفنا الكريم الدكتور نزار ابراهيم. لكن اي شيء تساؤل مرحبا بكم. الا ما كانش يمكننا نختموا هذا اللقاء. يعني بصراحه هو لقاء شيق اكثر من ساعتين اللي اعتبره اطول لقاء لحد الساعه مع الضيوف الكرام ويذ هاي بروفايل جاست. Yeah, can we create a human body and more? This is a question. Yeah. Can we create human bodies? Um, oh, and move. Can we create human bodies and move? Um, and move, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, we can interfere in the process of creating a human body, but creating a human body from scratch, so to speak, is probably not something we can do. Um, but we are now at a place where we can interface 
between many different uh, disciplines. So we can create, you know, bionic bodies. We can theoretically um, um, tinker with with our genes, and you know, in theory, you could you know do all kinds of things that I think would be very negative and dangerous, like trying to create super soldiers or you know changing human bodies in a way that you know are creating designer babies. There's a there's a d- dangerous path um, where ethics becomes very important. Um, but creating a human body from scratch uh, is not something we can do. Yeah, especially when it comes to the soul. How can we do that? Well, that's, that's uh, again, a kind of a definition matter how I think different people and different cultures define these things very differently. Um, and, and if you talk to a brain scientist, they will probably define it very differently in terms of brain chemistry and neurons versus some ghost-like entity, right? There's this really functioning of the brain, which is a, a really interesting area of, of, of work, but yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, please? Yeah, I think uh, the question already mentioned. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I will try to. Uh, yeah, uh, knowing a bit about. Uh, God, no, sorry, maybe. Uh, someone said that uh, some people think, uh, if I remember the question, that they, they think that's uh, fossils and uh, the idea that dinosaurs uh, existed before is a lie. So how could you answer people who think that it's uh, a lie? It's, <laughs> I think it's, we have evidence. It's, it's a little bit like if, I, if, if, you know, some people say that the Egyptian civilization is a lie. There are some people in that yeah. say that the pyramids were built by aliens from outer space, you know, or it would be a little bit like saying the Roman Empire is a lie. And they might say, we, 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 we don't see the Roman Empire now. But of course, we have many, 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 many finds, um, archaeological sites. We have historical sites that show us that the Roman Empire existed. We know it from languages. We know it from so many things, you know, um, but some people might, it's a bit like that. If someone tells you the Roman Empire never existed, you would say, how can you say that? There's so much evidence, right? It's a bit like that. You know, we, we, I touch and find dinosaur skeletons. So we see them in museums. We study them. I get paid to work on them. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's um, this is the kind of thing where I think, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just conspiracy theories because these are obviously some of the best documented things in the world. It's a bit like saying that the ancient skulls you mentioned from Morocco, the human skulls, oh, they don't exist. They were not found. They were fabricated by scientists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have evidence for that. Uh, so here is a question maybe in German. Uh, I, will, I will post this. Could you please read it? Sure. Yeah, I think it's in German, right? Yeah. Oh, this is basically, um, can any of our finds be uh, compared with um, with the religious content and religious books and so on? As I said, the the um, all, all our knowledge of the history of life on earth is based on science. So um, religious texts and books and so on is a different topic, a different world, but there's really no overlap. It's not like we're finding something that we say, oh, this was mentioned in this, you know, religious text and so on. And I think, you, again, you have to remember, there are many, many religions in the world and many, many religious people through history. Some religions are extinct, you know. There's nobody that believes in Zeus and Apollo today. Um, oh, yeah. There was a big religion at the time. Um, but the, the world of science was always in a different sphere, right? We, the discoveries we're making about dinosaurs, are, different angle. are not, not connected to, to those other worlds, no. Yeah, so here is a question uh, for beginners or kids. Uh, how can we teach them about paleontology and anatomy? That's a good question. Um, there are some good, I think for children, dinosaurs are great because kids love dinosaurs. So if you have a dinosaur book, it introduces them to anatomy, to geology, to biology, um, uh, even to some other topics, like when the meteorite hit our planet, it introduces them to these kinds of topics. 
So that's a great way to get them started. But then later on, you can, um, you can, there's a lot of good books. One that I would recommend for kids that are a bit older and, and adults is a book by um, a, co a former colleague of mine in Chicago. Um, it's called Your Inner Fish. And there's also a, a TV series and I'll write it in the chat for you. You can share it with people. But um, it's, uh, it's a really great book and TV series. And um, it's, it's um, it basically looks at the human body and, and it explains why our human body looks the way it does by going back in time. So Neil Shubin is a professor of paleontology and he's also running the human anatomy lab at the University of Chicago. So he shows the students how the human body became the way it is over time and um, how some of the anatomical structures we use are inherited from fish. Um, that's why the book is called Your Inner Fish. Um, so that's a really great resource for the topic, I would say. But it's for older kids. It's it's you know and and adults. It's really more of an adult uh, book and and series. But it's a really good one. So I'm trying to share this. Uh, maybe my connection. Yeah. Yeah. Great. This one. Yeah. Your inner fish by Neil Shubin. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so another question here. I think. Uh, this is in Arabic. I'll try to. Mm -hmm. That is. I think my connection. Yeah. لما لم نجد عددا كبير من الأحافير لكائنات تطورت لكائنات تطور ما دام تحدث منذ الأزل. Why we didn't find, let's say, some organisms which evolved. Many organisms, but I think we found. I think you've talked about this. Yeah, we have. We have many. I think this is. You sometimes hear that people might say, "Oh, we haven't found the transitional fossils, for example, that show the evolution from one group to another." But we have many. We have transitional fossils from fish to land animals, from whale ancestors to whales. Um, from uh, we have, of course, many early human fossils. We have from dinosaurs to birds. We, there are so many. Um, but again, unfortunately, some some um, online propaganda uh, tries to to basically uh, make sure that people don't really get to experience the incredible um, you know reality of, of scientific discoveries that are just awe inspiring and and incredible. Yeah, I think uh, so. Here are just the questions that I have received. Uh, I think um, other questions uh, we have, uh, Dr. Nizar uh, has answered all of them. Uh, yes, because talked about evolution, uh, the fo fossils, paleontology, anatomy, dinosaurs, and other amazing issues. So just for people who just joined us, you can, uh, uh, so we will share with you the link to the, the, the webinar recording uh, if you want to follow this amazing, and historic event with Professor Dr. Nizar Ibrahim. Uh, yes, another question. Yes, uh, what do you think? Uh, yes, this is uh, another question. Maybe we didn't talk about this. Maybe dealers. Yeah. Maybe dealers. Yeah. Uh, those, this is a, uh, difficult, yeah, a difficult. The black market. Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult topic. There are some local people, and they live in remote parts of the country sometimes, and they collect fossils for a living. And, you know, many important fossils are found by amateur collectors. So that's not necessarily yeah. a bad thing. And um, I think the problem is that some really important fossils are taken out of, of the country and then they end up in a private collection or even in another museum, but then they're not available to people in Morocco, for example, which I think is, you know, I think if you want... To, that's another reason to have a museum, so you can actually show some of these incredible discoveries in their country of origin. So it's not black and white, it's kind of a gray area. I think, you know, collecting by amateurs can be important, but there has to be some regulation and there has to be a, a good place in the country where these fossils can be shown, because otherwise, even if you have strict laws, the fossils will just, you know, crumble to pieces and, you know, you need people to take good care of them and have a proper museum and laboratories and so on. But 
yeah, it's um, fossil trade is a complicated topic. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nizar Ibrahim, for joining us for today's webinar, for enlightening us. Uh, this is actually an interesting and amazing issue, and we, you are really, we really benefited a lot from your mirac mirac uh, miraculous, let's say, uh, experience. Uh, so uh, I would like also to thank uh, the audience for joining us and for their interest and uh, in this very important issue. Um, so uh, I would say that um, this. Uh, we will not, uh, I hope it would be beneficial for all of us, and I'm sure it is. So uh, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Ibrahim, for joining us and for the time you have taken to be here with us. I hope to see you here in Morocco for in an international conference organized here by our university, why not here in Mouris Ma'il in Meknes, for everybody to benefit from uh, your experience. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was... It was um... Great fun, and yeah, I hope that we can travel soon and um, that we can meet in person. Yeah, I hope so. Shukran bizef. Shukran bizef. Can you say some, yeah, a few sentences in Darija? <laughs> well, my, my Darija, um, <laughs> my Darija is, is probably better for, for when I come to in person to Morocco, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, especially with people who help you, the local people, especially in the southeast uh, Morocco. Yeah, although there the Darija is not that um, that useful sometimes, because uh, when you go down there, you talk to them in Darija, and um, you know there's some people they will um, talk mostly in Amazir. Amazir, yeah. And so it's uh, it's a whole other world out there. I think we, we think of, you know, so my, my colleague from um, Samir Zuhri, he's at the La Fac des Sciences of Darbida. He's, um, he gets, you know, um, confused sometimes when he's down there and, you know, because they speak Amazir, so he needs some help to, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we all, we all I think we all have to work on our Amazir language skills. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you, uh, the audience. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. So uh, I could declare that this debate or webinar officially concluded. Thank you. All right. Ms. Lam. Is people still there? So, yeah, you can just leave the studio, yeah. Yeah. Shukran, yeah, thank you. Then, shukran lakum al-mustasibbi al-kareem ala had al-hudur ma'ana al-yawm fa al-liqa al-mubashir al-khas ma'a doktor Nizar Ibrahim. Tmenna anna had al-liqa ikun nal i'ajab di al-kum jami'an wa an fima yakhus ilm al-shrih wa ilm al-hifriyat. أتمنى اقتصام هذا الفيديو غادي يكون إن شاء الله تسجيل دائما على الصفحة كما العادة لكي تعم الفائدة خصوصا بالنسبة للباحثين الناس المهتمين في هذا المجال شكرا جزيلا السلام عليكم